Hi, I'm Rusty Dornan from the Kaufman Fellows Academy, and I am delighted to welcome back the co-instructor for Startup CEO, Clint Corver. Clint was really the one who founded the Kaufman Fellows Academy courses uh, that we went into production last year, and he's been a part of the venture deals, raising startup capital, startup CEO. You'll see them on all those courses. He's also COO of NovaWed, which is the platform the courses are on. So welcome, Clint. Thanks. I'm delighted to be here. Good. We're going to talk today a little bit about uh, your personal operating system. Um, you've been involved in startups, several startups. How important is it for a founder to really manage their agenda and figure out a personal operating system? So I'd say the most important aspect of a CEO's success is how they manage their time and how they prioritize their activities. And this is a constant struggle in startup companies. You've got a to-do list of a hundred things on it and you can only get 20 of them done. And so it's really a 24-7 job. And I think the most successful CEOs are the ones who figure out, you know, of those hundred things, what are the four that really have to get done and how do I do them? And then monitor the other 96 because they're going to be important at some point in time. And so you need some way that you can keep track of all this stuff and some way to be reminded when the, the things you're not doing are important and really need to be done. Yeah, it's interesting because this part of Matt's book is at the end of the book, you know, about how to manage yourself and how to manage others. And it was really your idea to bring forward this creating your personal operating system to the front of the book or front of the class so that people would be working on it. How important is it for people to start creating it early and how will it help them? Well, I, I think that this is a really a style fit in terms of your personal operating system. So Matt's got a very particular style. He's very detail-oriented, and there's some tools that you can look at. It's like he, he really tracks all aspects of his life in a very detailed way. And that works for some, but it doesn't work for other folks. And so the idea here is not that you adopt you know, Matt's personal operating system, but it's more that you create an operating system that works for you. And I've, matter of fact, I'm, I'm constantly working on my operating system. I work at a slightly different way than Matt, but it's this notion that I'm, I'm still always trying to keep my priorities straight. And then, by the way, as you grow your team, the question is, well, how do you help your team keep on top of the priorities as well? And when you're the startup CEO, you've got the whole company in your head. You've got this big picture of how everything fits. So something new pops up, and it's very easy for you to make trade-offs and fit it in. That's, not, that's very difficult for your team to do. So part of your job as a CEO is to help your people be successful, and that's also part of your personal operating system. So this is a very complicated um, and sophisticated system at the end of the day when it's successful. So I think the I, motivation for bringing it to the beginning of the class is to give people multiple shots at iterating on this um, so that hopefully by the end you'll have something that's useful. You know, what would you consider the top three things that are essential to when you're creating your personal operating system? So I'd say number one is always keep the big picture in mind. And when I think about, you know, as a startup company, your big picture is trying to basically, so you, to use some of the Steve Blank words, number one is to find product market fit. So you're trying to build a product or market that really meets the needs of a, of a marketplace. And then once you've done that, you've created value for somebody, now the idea is to build a scalable sales process, build a business model, they call it, around that need that you solved. So that's, those are like the two high-level things to keep in mind. But your daily, if you, your, your life as a startup CEO is people problems and customer problems and technology problems and all this detail-level stuff that absolutely has to be addressed, but it needs to be done in service of what you're trying to accomplish overall for the company. So I put that number one. It's like how do you connect the dots between your fundamental job as a CEO of a startup and what you're doing on a daily life, daily basis. Okay. So, Go ahead. Were you, did you want to finish? Yeah, so I'd say that's number one. That's kind of complicated, but you know that that's kind of like if you, if you do nothing more than that, um, I'd argue um, you are way ahead of the ball game for 90% of the startup CEOs out there. Um, number two, I think, is don't drop the important balls. You're going to drop a lot of balls as a CEO. Matter of fact, the more successful you are as a company, the more balls you're going to drop because that's just life. You want to make sure you're dropping the balls. You're not dropping the balls that matter most. And by the way, the ideal would be you're conscious about the balls you're dropping and you're letting people know you're going to drop the ball. 
So, and, and so th this could be like an automated email reply. It can be a, hey, look, you know, I thought I was going to be able to do something here. I'm really not. And so like, I guess the third thing I would say was be manage your relationships with all your stakeholders, your employees, potential investors, um, your your vendors, and these are the, and these are the folks that are going to make your your company work. And so your personal operating system, when it works well, allows you to do a better job managing these relationships. And you should be staying on top of this. How often? Just sort of you know watching yourself on it. Should you be? Should you keep it almost like a journal where you're writing in it every day and just kind of taking a look at what's going on? So, so the the operating systems that I've seen be effective, you're literally referring to it almost every hour. Wow. So like so at at my office at at, uh, at work, I've got one computer where I've essentially got my personal operating system up all the time, and and that includes my calendar, it's my to-do list, it's the relationships that I need to work on, it's the key projects. I use a 30, 60, 90 day kind of um, high level map to organize all my projects. And it's, it's the sort of thing where you know, it's so easy to get distracted. I keep having to, myself, I need, to, I need reminders to pull myself up to be focusing on what's most important. Okay. Uh, we do have some viewers with us and we do have a question. I have a product idea and my team is working on the prototype. I am not interested in a VC but would like to sell the product to clients and engage them as partners and seek investments. Can I do it with multiple clients without having interest of conflict, conflict of interest? Well, so first thought is the absolute best funding you can possibly get is customers paying you for a product or a service. So that's far better than venture capital funding. It, it does a couple of things. So one is you don't have to sell parts of your company with that. And the second is it's actually validating your business model. Now, so I'd say, you know, you know, kudos to you. This is exactly the right thing to do from my point of view, the ideal thing to do in building a business. Now, I would try to keep separate the customers buying your product versus customers investing in your company. Because that does, does can, create, can create problems. So if a big customer wants to literally buy part of your company as an investor, essentially that can diminish your ability to sell to their their competitors. So I and, and I, I've run across this in the sense that um, once somebody's an investor, they now get information or it's perceived that they'll get information on your finances, your product, your other customers, and so it definitely can create the perception of a conflict of interest, even if you've managed it so it's really not internally. So as much as you possibly can, I would recommend try put that customer's excitement in you into buying more of your product and not in terms of investing into your company. Uh, along the lines of a fundraising process, you know, more than half the students in this course say that they are founding a company. What would be your advice to them right off the top before they start launching their fundraising efforts? So, so I think the first step in this is to understand the investor's point of view. And their kind of primary point of view is they don't like risk. I know it sounds strange, but the uh, I, the ideal investment from an investor's point of view is a startup company that's proven they're solving a need in the market. They've proven that they can scale, and they just need a little bit more capital to now you know do the exponential thing. So, investing in a in a startup company before customers before scale is something that a lot of investors, even venture capitalists, frankly have a hard time doing. So, so, so given that context, I would think about how can you take as much risk off the table as possible for investors. So a paying customer takes risk off the table in the sense that you've actually built something that somebody's willing to pay for. So you've got a data point. You know, having 10 paying customers takes more risk off the table. So, and, and by the way, at least in Silicon Valley, there are so many good startups looking for funding that you know, you, you really have to make some meaningful progress in terms of taking risk off the table to get the interest of a venture capitalist. So should they be looking at family and friends and their own credit cards and that sort of thing first to, to be able to show something to a future investor? Yeah, I mean, so if you look at like the some of the very best companies out there, you know, the Facebooks and Googles of the world and so forth, essentially they started with no funding from anybody. So they basically they started in a sense actually just kind of doing it on the side with their own time. So that's like self-funding in the sense. 
Um, you know, the next step up is you need a little bit of, and by the way, you can do so, in the software world in particular, you can do so much with very little funding because of all the free tools available to you online. So there's a high expectation in the software world of the amount of progress you'll make before you ever ask for any money. Now, in other areas where, especially areas that are capital intensive, this may not be practical. And so, if you think about it from the perspective of the investor, if you if you've never done something before, you say this is a, you know, I've never been in the oil and gas industry, but I want to start this oil and gas startup. Then the question is like, oh well, you're gonna have to prove to me you can actually do something because you know how would I know you you're really gonna be able to execute on this? So so in that sense, you're gonna have to you know figure out by hook or by crook some way to accomplish something. The other end of the spectrum is oh you know. I've actually been a senior executive at oil and gas companies for the last 30 years. You know, here's all the stuff that I've accomplished. So somebody like that, because they've got such deep domain expertise and such credibility on the execution, may be able to go get funding without actually having sort of essentially built something or gotten customers. But the risk they're taking off the table is their experience. So they're a believable kind of person. Okay, and uh, don't be shy out there. I'm surprised we're not getting some more questions. I know you. Uh, this is a great opportunity to talk to uh, co-instructor Clint Corver, who's founded, uh, has had a, several startups of his own, and is now involved in NovaWed and talking about personal operating system and anything you want to talk about really for startups. Um, founders are always going to be sort of overwhelmed by people wanting a piece of them, you know, whether it's by email or face to face, that sort of thing. What's the best way to sort of handle handle that, you know, especially if there are people that you're working with uh, who are constantly asking you questions and, and that sort of thing? How do you, how do you manage your time effectively that way without going crazy? Well, so I guess you know a couple of thoughts on that. So to the extent you've got other people that work with you, I find a really effective strategy is to give them essentially more responsibility. So you see, think about like all the conversations you want to have in the company. And this, by the way, this is a personal preference, but I also think it's um, generally considered a best practice in management, which is give your employees and the people that work for you really large projects, high-level guidance in terms of what success looks like, and then let them go. So I, so I find a lot of startup CEOs also don't have a lot of experience management in management, and so they tend to be too involved in the details, and that just kills your time. So you got to figure out how to work at the at the right kind of level with your co-founders or your employees, and I'd say that's probably at the top of the list. And then second on the list would just be kind of extreme discipline, in the sense of you know there's a lot of good things that come your way, and you basically have to say no to all the good things so that you can focus on the very small number of things that are really going to matter. Okay. Uh, we have a few questions now suddenly. Uh, what is the best option? Run as long as you can before going to funding or get funding and grow quickly? So in my mind this really depends on your competitive landscape. So if you're in a situation where there's not a lot of competition or it's not competition that's going to take your market opportunity, I think running as long as you can before you're getting funding and essentially proving as much and taking as much off the table is going to give you the best shot at not only getting funded, but getting funded, excuse me, at a good valuation. So the time that changes is if you're in a marketplace where there's lots of competition, and if you don't grow aggressively, the opportunity in the market's going to go away. Uh, next question: How much equity should I be giving away for initial development team if we are not paying salaries to get to the first paying customer? For instance, if there are two co-founders, tech development and business sector oriented. Yeah, so actually splitting equity among co-founders is a really tricky topic and most people do a bad job of it. So the easy answer is, oh, there's two of us, we're going to split it 50-50. So I'd say that's a really bad default because it doesn't have, it doesn't force the hard conversation about contribution. So I'd argue that you want to split equity based on current and potential future contributions. And actually this is a really sensitive and difficult conversation to have but in the very beginning of the company when you're founding it you're in this honeymoon period and so call this a good test to your co-founders if you can't have this difficult conversation when you're in the honeymoon period you know when you get like a year down the road and you can't pay salaries or you're gonna have to cut off a customer or you have really difficult conversations like that you're probably not gonna be able to have those as well so, so I, I counsel entrepreneurs up front to really address this explicitly in terms of how we're gonna how, who's contributing what, 
how do we measure that and let's make equity uh, proportional to contribution and that's a really painful difficult conversation and that's a good thing because you're testing the relationship out up front okay, good how to set up solid and productive relations between co-founders I am interested in other means than merely emotional connection being friends etc because I've seen that changing are there any systematic principles yeah you know in some ways it's call it you know good management good leadership are the principles for setting up a, a working relationship up front and some of the challenges by the way with co-founding with friends is difficulty having the tough conversations so so imagine you're working with somebody that you don't know and they do a poor quality job in I don't know they're gonna do an analysis of the market and they come back and they just haven't done a very good job it's typically it might be a little uncomfortable but a lot of people can say hey look you know this really isn't what I wanted and you know here's some problems in the analysis we need to redo that but if you add on to that a friendship, then people were even more reluctant to have that hard conversation in terms of giving feedback. So, so I'd say you know the the principles for starting a company aren't any different than the principles of just working effectively in the company. And they're things like being clear about the roles, um, being clear about the commitments you're making to people. So what you're going to do, when, under what conditions, and then giving feedback to folks. You know if they've accomplished that or if they haven't. Okay. Thinking about internet startups, how far do you think an entrepreneur can go with mock-ups and other forms of pre-development validation before committing to writing code and launching a prototype? Oh, well, I mean, this is the whole um, basic uh, sort of, if you will, motivation for the, the lean startup and Eric Ries in the sense of, you know, he spent a year or two years with IMVU building all this code and nobody ever even signed up for the product. And he could have found that out literally by putting a website up saying, here's my product, you know, click here to sign up. I mean, so, it, so basically literally in, you know, 15 minutes, he could have put something up that would have gathered the information that would have saved him two years worth of effort. And I think that general principle, especially in the software industry, applies really well. And there's a lot of clever ideas out there for how you validate that people would really want what you've got before you write even your first line of code. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of essentially this lean startup approach. Okay. In setting up an operating system, how to balance democracy and autocracy, and should that be explicitly declared to the team? Yes, this, this is a really good one. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of transparency. So there, there are some people out there that say, you know, if people think that they're part of the decision-making process, even if they're not, that's good for morale. But in my mind, that's an inauthentic way to create relationships. And it may seem easier in the beginning, but it's eventually going to bite you because people are smart. They'll figure out that if they're just participating for show. So what I like to do is be clear about who, what role people are making in the decisions up front. And there's a framework I like to use called vote, voice, and visibility, which are the three roles people can play in a decision-making process. So vote means they're at the table when the decision is being made. Now it may be that you as the CEO can veto what's going on, so it might be that you know it's not everybody's vote counts equally, but they're at the table when the decision is being made. The next is voice, and so voice means you explicitly want to hear their point of view before the decision gets made. So they're not at the table when the decision gets made, but they're going to be explicitly included in the process. Visibility means you're not explicitly going to reach out to them, but you're going to make sure that they understand essentially what's kind of been happening. So what decisions have been made. So I'll give you an example. So imagine commissions for salespeople. He might say that the people with the vote are going to be the CEO and the VP of sales. Now the people with a voice are going to be the CFO and some of the tap salespeople. And the people with visibility are going to be, you know, all those sales folks that are going to have to now live under this new commission structure. Okay, we got another question here. Connected question on equity: Should one be giving non-founding developers any equity instead of cash? Any resources that we could look to for benchmarks? So th this early stage of the company, before you've got money to pay salaries, it's it's kind of like whatever you can make work. So if you can get somebody to you know who's a good coder that's going to work with you for I don't know the promise of a job but no equity right now, hey, that's great. You know, if you can really keep them motivated and so forth, absolutely do that. Um, for the most part, what I've seen, at least in Silicon Valley, is the really great programmers 
have a lot of opportunities. So you're going to have to actually be somewhat generous on equity if you can't pay them in stock. And then there's there's not really like I said good benchmarks on this. So you know if I were to I were to give a range, I'd say you know I've seen people get a fraction of a percent up front like this, and I've seen people get 10% of a company up front. And it just depends on how important they are to the success of the company. And essentially, do you have any other options? Because if they're critical to the success of your company and you don't have any other options, okay, now you're giving away a big chunk of the company. And don't you have to really think about that too when you're thinking about funding down the line, how other investors are going to feel about the, you know, that you've given away huge chunks of the company? You know, so that's an interesting comment. So, so actually, investors don't care that much in the sense that, you know, so there's such a wide range of how co-founders split. And, th and they're going to consider, you know, so before that, that first round of VC, they're consider essentially all the employees are kind of like co-founders. And so whatever deal you've got with them, you know, it's probably they're going to be okay with. With the one exception, if they think there's important people that don't have enough stock and therefore don't have, um, are sort of at risk of leaving the company. So they, so they might say, for example, oh, yeah, I think, you know, Bob over there needs a little more stock because, you know, that seems really below benchmarks. But for the most part, they're not going to comment that, you know, something seems too high because it's like, you know, you did what you did to, you know, draw the people in at the beginning. Right. Uh, this is a little bit similar to the previous question. Do you know of any online resources, hang on a second, it just any online resources that have information on stock options, amounts, vesting, schedules, or other mechanics? Ideally, resource would have industry benchmarks. So, so this this is really country specific. So, in the U.S., yeah, there's a, there's actually some pretty good benchmarks. A lot of the law firms, for example, so Wilson Sonsini, uh, Cooley, um, Fenwick, they basically will um, you know, put these reports out there and tell you know, here are the things that we're seeing either in, on the funding and sometimes in the stock options. Um, there's a really st a standard in Silicon Valley. It's four year vesting with a one year cliff. And so what that means, if you get, say, a thousand shares of stock, for the first year you don't invest in any of that. At the end of at your one year anniversary, you invest in 25% of it. So you get 20, uh, 250 shares. And then every month thereafter, you get essentially one thirty sixth of what's left. So at the end of four years, you've invested you invested the whole thing. So that's like the standard deal. And I'd say 90 plus percent of all startup companies give the standard deal on that kind of stock options. In terms of the amount of stock that you give out, there's a couple of research reports that are done out there. There's a guy, a Noam Wasserman from Harvard, who has partnered with, I'm forgetting the consulting firm, but if you look up Noam Wasserman and stock options, you'll see this report. And uh, you essentially have to participate as a company. So you have to share your information, on your you know, how you split stock in your company, and then in return, you can see the benchmarks. And there's a, and I think that one's free. There's a, a couple of other ones that are paid. So there's one called Advanced HR, advanced-hr.com, and you pay for that. I think that's maybe like ten thousand dollars a year. So that's maybe when you're a little more advanced. How to decide on a price for my product, internet software as a service? So pricing is a whole field unto itself. I'd say a couple of rules of thumb. So one would be you have to figure out how your customers perceive your product. So if they perceive it as being a Dropbox-like thing, for example, then you know if you're doing something much different than Dropbox-like pricing, it's probably going to be pretty difficult for you. So there are a couple like big benchmarks out there. So like Salesforce.com, for example. So their software as a service, and you know, they're pretty expensive. So they may charge anywhere from forty to hundred dollars per person per month depending on what features they have in there. Now, it's a very sophisticated, high-end, business-to-business product. So that's kind of like one benchmark that's out there. Um, there's a lot of you know, free stuff that for a couple of bucks a month, you can get like the more advanced stuff. You know, think of like Basecamp, for example. This is an online project management software that's, you know, I forget its exact price, but it's on the order of, a, you know, there's a free service, and then for five bucks a month or something pretty cheap, you can get some other uh, products. You can get some other value out of it. So if you're in a consumer sort of area or a business like a Salesforce, find benchmarks, and then you need to test essentially, so you think you're like Salesforce, well do your customers believe it? And if your customers believe you're like Salesforce, then you can charge Salesforce like pricing. Okay. 
Do you consider that it is a good move to ask investors for seed capital so you can quit your day job and start working on your startup 100% of the time uh, yes. after you are validated? So, so, so th this is an argument that almost never works, at least with sophisticated investors. So a sophisticated investor doesn't want you to be kind of half in and half out. So if you say, well, I can't quit my day job until I get funding, that looks like a mediocre level of commitment. So you know, maybe they put money in and maybe you still don't quit your day job. So, or maybe you do, but it's like, you know, they don't want to be the reason why you commit to something. They want to see you 100% committed to making something a success, and then they're going to help you do that, but only after they see your 100% commitment. Any guidance to teams where co-founders are living in different countries? How best to deal with the ownership interest, for instance? Any other practices slash guidance uh, would you suggest other than this makes it really hard? <laughs> Well, so I'd, I'd say you know the the, the standard principles ap apply in the sense of have the con the conversation about contribution and you know link equity to contribution. So that I think doesn't change. Now there's potentially a legal wrinkle in here in the sense of if you have uh, somebody in a different country owning a large chunk of your company, you know, there may be rules that either prevent that or um, make that more complicated. So like just think of like Alibaba just went public, and it turns out that all of the investors in Alibaba are actually not really investing in the company Alibaba. So Alibaba has essentially this variable interest entity, they call it, that's a Cayman Island that has a contract with Alibaba for the profits. So you're investing in the Cayman Island company and you got to share of the profits. So basically now the Chinese government could say, hey, these variable interest entities, they're illegal. And all of a sudden all those investments just go away in terms of their value. So, hmm. so, so that's, that's a, so if you have a, I mean, that's a particular issue with China and ownership, where they have restrictions on foreign owners in Chinese companies. So that's a, maybe an extreme example, but when you have founders in different countries, I would highly recommend you get legal advice to make sure that, you know, to, so when you set things up, there aren't things like this that are required. Okay. Uh, let us say if a company reviewing few revenue model options and business model, but funding is required to test and validate those. Does angel do angel investors consider investing in any of these businesses? Yeah, so so angel investors are definitely a different animal. I'd say they have a different set of standards than venture capitalists. So an angel investor, and I'm I'm going to generalize here, but an angel investor is kind of more focused on things like, do I relate to this person? You know, is this somebody I believe in? And if they believe in them, then, you know, kind of their criteria around, you know, how far you've built the business are maybe going to be less than venture capitalists. Uh, another, by the way, um, key criteria for a lot of angels is how much do I relate to this company? So is this company building something that's in an area that I understand? Are they in a geography that, you know, I'm in? Do I have these kind of connection points? And so, so you absolutely can get angels to invest when you can't get VCs to invest if you have these other, these other kind of decision criteria are fulfilled. This is a good one. If you are approached by good investors, when and why would you say no to an investor? Wouldn't any more money help grow the company faster? <laughs> so, you know, in general, it's, uh, I've heard this expression, when you're at the, fill your canteen up when you're at the river. <laughs> So yeah, so if somebody wants to put more money into the company and you know they're high quality VCs, you know I would seriously think about bringing more money into the company. Now, the reason you wouldn't want to do that, and and this is called a high quality problem. But if you say, well, we've got enough money right now to essentially hit this next set of fundable milestones and then raise more money at a much higher valuation, so giving away money right now is expensive. Let's say I'm selling my I'm I'm selling shares at a dollar a share right now. So if I bring in an extra hundred dollars, it's going to cost me a hundred shares. Whereas, you know, a year from now, if I've proven out the market, I might be able to sell five dollars each. And so now I sell twenty shares to bring in a hundred dollars. So I keep more ownership in the company. Okay. So it's really is kind of trade off in terms of um, ownership in the company and the. I think we're having some problems. The um, There's some problems, I think, with the feed or something. Let's try one more question. You're you really broke up on that last the last part of that last one, Clint. I think you're back now. So let's try another one. 
VCs seem to be focused on capital light opportunities. How do you interest them or take risk off the table and get funding for a more complex enterprise software product that will take more resources and time to create for a large market? Yeah. So, um, so that so call it the standard venture capital story is still alive and well, which says, um, you know, there's reasons to believe in me as an entrepreneur. There's reasons to believe in this market opportunity, and it's just going to take uh, an investment to get there. So it's, uh, I'd say the bar is higher in terms of the quality of the individuals and the quality of the market opportunity to get a big check. So it's sort of safer in some ways to write a $500,000 check, test the market, write a $5 million check and that sort of thing versus writing a $20 million check up front. But there absolutely are companies that are getting you know, the $20 million checks up front because they're, compli they're going after a really big problem. The bars are just higher. Uh, last question here. Any opinion on using consulting as an early stage way to get cash in the door to fund product development? It is enterprise solution focused. Yeah, you know, it's it's hooker by crook. You know, whatever it takes to you know get that company from nothing to a something. You know, I think you should do. And so, so, so by the way, I've, I've used consulting in a couple of my startup companies to get that early cash to keep things going. Uh, the other benefit of consulting is it often gives you a really tight relationship with a customer, and so in particular if the consulting is related to the area where you're building your technology product, this can be a great way of doing uh, customer research. Now, the caveat, by the way, on this is um, most investors don't want to invest in service companies because it's low margin and it's uh, the growth rates. It grows linearly with people as opposed to technology, which grows exponentially. So you want to be careful that you don't get sort of sucked into becoming a consulting company if you really want to be a technology company. Okay, great. And uh, before we go, thank you so much, Clint, for uh, being with us today. I think people got a lot of really good questions answered. I do want to plug the course, however, because there might be some folks that are watching that are not uh, taking the Startup CEO course, and it will still be open uh, this week through tomorrow. So if you aren't a part of Startup CEO and a part of these weekly hangouts, you can see definitely see the value. Also, if you haven't purchased the book, Matt's book, it's a good idea. It uh, the, you know, he goes into detail. He and Clint go into detail, but certainly the book really flushes out a lot more things and can be just a great guide for you. Uh, Clint, thank you so much. Anything you want to add here after our conversation today on personal operating systems or anything else? <laughs> it's been a pleasure, Rusty. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot.